Hello and welcome back to our Ancient Path series on the Christian Devotions. Using Matthew chapter 6 as a guide text, we've been looking at giving, prayer and fasting. And last time we explored devotional worship as a personal lifestyle rather than just something we do in meetings. So finally we come to Matthew 6 verses 25 to 34 where Jesus teaches us about, well, not worrying. So what's that got to do with our devotional life? What's the link? <laughs> okay, it may seem like an unusual one this, but Christian meditation is an often overlooked or even misunderstood devotion. Because we do see meditation practiced and exhorted throughout the scriptures, but not taught or practiced much by many. So what is meditation? How do we do it? And what's it got to do with Jesus' teaching on not worrying about our lives? And also, isn't meditation to do with Eastern religions like Buddhism? Surely we shouldn't have anything to do with that kind of thing. Well, we'll answer all these questions and more in this episode. So let's begin to look at the Christian devotion of meditation. In 1934, T.S. Eliot wrote a poem called Choruses from the Rock. Here's a snippet. The endless cycle of idea and action, endless invention, endless experiment, brings knowledge of motion, but not of stillness, knowledge of speech, but not of silence, knowledge of words and ignorance of the word. It was a prophetic poem in a century that saw the application of innovation explode upon the world. Flight, cars, telephony, cinema, television, computers and internet. We even put a man on the moon. But in all this activity and progress, Eliot asks in his poem, where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? In its essence, Christianity is a relationship. Jesus said, now this is eternal life, that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, John 17. This is the wisdom and knowledge that T.S. Eliot feared we were losing in our endless cycle of idea and action, experiencing the real relational knowledge of God in here, in our hearts. This special relationship with God isn't based on any physical ability of our bodies or our brain's intellectual skill, which is good to know, isn't it? Because God is spirit. Rather, it's a matter for the spirit, our spirit communing and knowing God's spirit. Deep calling to deep. From around the 5th century AD in the medieval West, Christianity was nurtured in an atmosphere of commitment and devotion, in monasteries and nunneries. The goal was not the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, but edification and worship, contemplation and adoration of God through a lifestyle of devotion. The theologian was not a detached observer, but a committed, involved participant. The highest goal was relational knowledge of God. 
but by the 11th century it became more important to be a philosopher than to be a godly man. Universities birthed scholastic theology. The goal was objective intellectual knowledge. Even the idea that one could experience God began to be challenged. As Paul says in Romans 1.22, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. The discipline of meditation helps us to come away from what T.S. Eliot called knowledge of words and ignorance of the word and come back to a place of deep understanding to stop striving and know that he is God. Strong's translates several Hebrew words as meditate. They're words that are associated with muttering, chewing and murmuring. They suggest an act of repetitious speaking. Here's a couple of scriptures that contain Hebrew words meditate. Joshua 1 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. And Psalm 104, May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. And in the New Testament, we're told, If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The Bible doesn't tell us how to meditate because in ancient Arabic culture, the practice would have been commonplace. So when Genesis 24 tells us that Isaac went out to meditate in the fields towards evening, what was he doing? What exactly is meditating and how does it help us? We need to beware and guard against becoming involved in popular forms of Eastern meditation. For instance, yoga, though principally a physical activity, is also a form of meditation. The word yoga means to yoke, an expression of the linking of the human soul with the universal soul. Many of the positions in yoga are moving mantras or prayers to deities. Likewise, in modern transcendental meditation, the goal is often self-discovery or self-fulfillment and its methods are based around many ancient Hindu beliefs and writings. But biblical and Christian meditation are quite different from these practices. One of the essential differences is that in TM, those who meditate seek to empty themselves, whereas the goal of Christian meditation is to be filled with the Word and with the Spirit. meditation and Bible study do overlap. Meditating on the Bible will complement your Bible study in an enriching way because the Holy Spirit will bring fresh revelation to you through your meditations. Now the discipline of Bible meditation is repetition and memorization of words from the scriptures over and over again without moving on. This is what is meant by meditating. It's like chewing on food, which in many ways the Word of God is to our souls. So why not try writing a verse on a card or on your phone and carrying it with you throughout the day? Keep reading and reciting it until you have it memorised. Every time you forget a word, just read it again. Meditate on the word and let its life enter your heart. <laughs> 